Thank you so much for patience and that. Right. We have Siddharth, uh, he's the founder of and CEO of FASTA, a company that focuses on making the apps or service network faster. Hear, hear, hear him uh, uh, talk about FASTA, how FASTA uses OpenStreetMap to figure out Asia's complex mobile network and design systems to make it better. Over to you. bumped into it and uh, started understanding the power of it more clearly in the past year and a half. And um, a lot of the learnings that I've had in the past year and a half have been by lurking online in uh, some of the, uh, the data-oriented Slack channels for Bangalore and around. And um, Rasa Gyaher has been helpful in teaching me the tricks on how to use Mapbox uh, GLJS and how to use the styles and themes there. So um, our, my main area of interest has been performance, and performance specifically from an engineering perspective of, um, of the internet. And by extension, uh, as a consumer of uh, the mobile internet, how fast are our websites, how fast are our apps, and what makes a delightful user experience on your smartphone. Um, as, as our economies in uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia have evolved, um, our friends from uh, Bangladesh just told us that they have their own version of Swiggy and Uber and Ola, uh, which is doing all those deliveries. Uh, the on-demand economy has exploded. And uh, given our dearth of manufacturing jobs, a lot of our new job creation in India and Southeast Asia is happening by these service-oriented platforms. So, uh, more perhaps than an industrial park, uh, because we don't have manufacturing factories which are creating 100,000 jobs right off the bat. We have these on-demand platforms which are creating both ad hoc as well as uh, long-term employment. So we're going to be talking in terms of technology. There's a lot of tech here, but there is also uh, the, the backdrop of the business we're trying to create as a startup, which is help these on-demand businesses do a better job with connectivity and last mile networking. And when I mean networking, I really mean data networking, right? So that's the perspective we're going to talk about today. So who am I? I'm Siddharth. Uh, I studied uh, at the University of Arizona Signal Processing and Communications. I worked at a startup in Boston doing video streaming long ago, 2005. It feels like forever ago. Video streaming was a big deal then, especially on smartphones. Then I was at Nokia for a while, where I actually first got the chance to work on, uh, to work on open source software. Some of you might have used WebKit. Uh, if you use an Apple product, WebKit is what powers your browser. So your Safari browser on your Mac as well as uh, on your iPhone are powered by this open source software. It's a staggeringly complex piece of software because it needs to parse and render HTML files from back, back then in you know, 1990. So infinite backward compatibility and forward looking HTML file goodness are all things that it does. So that's uh, my first introduction to large open source projects of any sort. Uh, and then uh, about four years ago, I founded FASTA, which is uh, the company that, uh, that we're part of. Raghu here is also um, part of the team, so Raghu, please say hi. Uh, he has been incredibly uh, part of this journey, and I'll uh, talk about some specifics later. So the context, again, like I said, is that uh, the mobile internet is the new default internet. And um, the big guys of the big daddies and the big mommies of the internet who are Cisco, the slide is from Cisco, by the way. And I, I put it here to show uh, the data and the scale at which they capture data uh, in order to reflect 
the trends of the emerging internet. Uh, so the bottom, the bottom half, uh, I'll read it out to you, says that internet traffic growth is at the edge. Now what does edge mean? Edge means that cities are both the consumers of the mobile internet as well as the end recipients of the other part of the communication chain. And that's exactly what we saw. So for Patao, for example, there is a bicycle, uh, there's a motorcycle rider who needs to deliver food. He or she has uh, an app which is being paged in real time <coughs> on their 3G or 4G network. And uh, another consumer is requesting uh, those goods from another smartphone. So uh, if you've done statistics and probability, you can imagine that when there are multiple links in the chain, uh, the compound probability is lower than the probability of any one of them, right? So the failure rate of this transaction is only as good as the weakest link in the chain. Or conversely, on a more complex uh, scale, if you have five taxis around I in Bangalore, and they are all connected on 4G networks, and somebody here is trying to find one taxi around I in Bangalore, there are five active 4G connections which need to perform at a very low latency level for it to be a fair and equitable system of meeting supply and demand. So think of this from an operational efficiency and a, a marketplace or a real-time marketplace perspective. And you quickly figure out why cities are both the generators of demand uh, as well as the consumers of demand. So we map the internet like this. We build colorful maps showing latency. And latency, some of you might know, uh, are things. Uh, so this is, before I get into latency, these are livelihoods, again, these are interviews from Uber drivers and Ola drivers, which tell us that uh, it's really hard to end a trip, start a trip, be online, get jobs effectively, and things of that nature. And as a consumer, we discuss that everything from finding the nearest Grab Taxi in Southeast Asia, or finding now the nearest e-scooter or the e-bike, uh, which we have uh, Pedal and Yulu in Bangor now. So those are all internet-connected. Uh, bicycles and internet connected mobility platforms and they're all part of our mobility solution. As we know in Bangalore, we can't live with um, our extensive car traffic. So some of these solutions uh, are plug and play and are really going to help reduce congestion and urban quality of life uh, problems. So uh, coming back to latency and how we measure it, technically latency is the number of milliseconds it takes for data to go from your phone to the nearest server and come back. Right? That's milliseconds in latency, you might have used your uh, broadband tester at home to figure out if your uh, home broadband is any good. Uh, so this is broadly what it looks like. Your, these cars are all packets, and the packets get uh, delayed most of the time. So on a statistical basis, if most packets are delayed most of the time, that's a high, milli, high millisecond, high downtrip time latency that we're dealing with. And this is a very good predictor of laggy smartphone performance. Or in the case of an Uber driver, or a Gojek driver riding on a scooter, uh, this is going to cause him to be not reachable by their dispatch server. So he or she is not going to ride, get a ride if this is the condition of the network um, at that time. Uh, so the other factor is packet loss, and packet loss looks like this, right? So there are four packets, they're trying to get to the other side, but they fall off because there is no capacity uh, for them to be buffered or to cross over. And this can happen in a couple of places. This can happen, happen in your cellular network, which cellular we mean from your phone to the base station is the is the airwave part of it, and there can be uh, they can have a lot of interference and congestion there. I'll go into it later why, but a uh, lot of the routing points in between which take traffic from your phone to the rest backbone of the internet can 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 have these losses. Um, so I'll I'll show you uh, a quick demo which is more fun and which shows uh, real world maps. So this is a map, uh, I'll start with a simple one. Uh, this is a, a map of Singapore's biggest network, M1. So M1 is a big uh, mobile carrier there. And these are uh, basically the green zones are low latency and low congestion good zones. And the red zones, which are few, which is good, uh, means that they tend to have very high <coughs> latencies and or a lot of packets getting lost in transit. Now, uh, the fun starts when we think of not just dead zones and good zones, which is what this map is showing, but start incorporating the time of day. Because as we know, uh, traffic, say, at Singapore uh, does not stay stationary. Well, some of you may argue that it stays back throughout the day. But <laughs> one, could, one could argue that it uh, ebbs and flows. It peaks at, say, you know, 4 to 8 p.m. and then goes down later. 
Um, so if you have sufficient data for a part of the city which matters, you can make a time of day variation graph on it. And that results in a map like this, where you have uh, a bunch of hexagons again showing the quality of service or the quality of experience for that grid, which is about, uh, I think, one kilometer radius here, um, so the two kilometer diameter. And if you make a time animation, and this is all crowdsourced data, by the way, I'll get into that in a bit, but uh, FASTA collects all of this through our SDK and our own app. Um, our app is used a lot by driver partners. So driver partners on Gojek, uh, Uber, Ola, um, and uh, Grab, did I say Grab? So all of these guys use our app in Southeast Asia specifically. Um, so all of this flows from our own tooling and our own infrastructure, and we build our mapping here on top of it. So uh, as you can see here, uh, this varies during the time of day. And at uh, 9 a.m. peak zones, you see a few red spots developing, uh, which are basically, uh, to my understanding, residential zones where people come out when they start their commutes. Things get backed up at residential neighborhoods. Uh, people get to work quite early in Singapore, unlike Bangalore, it seems, because things are pretty quiet until uh, evening rush hours again. And then you see at around 8 p.m., you see these very localization, uh, localized hotspots developing around um, Suntech City, which happens to be a mall, if I am not wrong. And if you look at Google Maps, actually, Google Maps has these traffic layers, right? So you can imagine that, um, you can think of our stuff as basically Google traffic, but for networks, right? So just like Google traffic has these statistical models, this is that same area that I showed you, which develops a red spot in the evening. Uh, you can see that these roads are quite red at uh, this, I'm showing you 7.30. So at 7.30, there is a lot of traffic around Suntech City, and, that's, uh, and that clears up uh, during the day. Um, see, you can see more green around this uh, red marker in the center, uh, and things are pretty quiet during the day, uh, and they get heated up uh, both in the mornings and in the evenings. So at uh, very early in the morning, for example, this is pretty clean. And uh, evening times and morning times are high congestion times. So our, our, our model is that um, cellular congestion, and I'm going to go into the slides why that occurs, uh, is, is one of the causes. Uh, a more fun experiment is to look at uh, New Delhi. How much time do you have? Okay, do we have some buffer? Okay, excellent. So this is a map of New Delhi, and um, I have lived in New Delhi for about five years, so I have some uh, personal attachment with Connect Place. This is Connect Place. I used to drink Kevinter's milk there. Who, who has had Kevinter's in Delhi? Oh, yes. OK, good. So uh, we, we, we are way connecting there. So um, Kevinter's was right there uh, in the middle of CP. And uh, New Delhi railway station is right up north. Um, you see this area here with a lot of train tracks converging. And New Delhi railway station is probably, I don't know, probably India's biggest train station in terms of sheer number of trains coming in and going in, going out. Um, and uh, if you start thinking of uh, what happens during the day, uh, this is you know more grim uh, storytelling here. And why this came uh, as an idea to us was we were talking to a Uber operations guy in Delhi. And that gentleman said that if you are really working on a Delhi model, please help us with New Delhi railway station. Because there are tri tri uh, drivers waiting outside New Delhi railway station expecting us to give them a, an order. And there are people piling off out of trains, literally by the thousands every minute, all expecting us to instantly match demand with supply. And the drivers are irate because they don't get a page on their phone. And there are passengers who are obviously unhappy because they're unable to find a ride. And then everybody comes out and start arguing with the taxi drivers uh, or with the auto drivers, which is even worse. So um, as you can see here, uh, I'll play the animation semi-manually. Uh, actually, let me start in the morning. That's uh, more instructive. So this is 1 AM. Things are really beautiful and very really quiet. Um, the load latencies are 91 milliseconds, 77 milliseconds, uh, 59 milliseconds. These are not bad for a mobile network. And uh, we use a server in Mumbai, uh, Amazon Web Services Mumbai server to ping these. So you should add the fixed cost of the packet going from over a fiber cable from Delhi to Mumbai. This is generally a uh, you know, few, few, few milliseconds. So even if you subtract that fixed bias from this cost, these are pretty decent numbers uh, for a 4G network in Delhi. So this is uh, calibrated uh, already. 
the color coding uh, to both factor in these latency numbers and the congestion numbers which are about packets getting lost like I mentioned. So uh, this color coding is a composite of those two fundamental variables which uh, affect your quality of experience both as an end user as well as if you happen to be a driver partner or a, a motorcycle rider. So things are quiet in the morning and then uh, I would suggest you look at both the center which is current place and the north which is the New Delhi railway station because those are the most instructive. So 4 o'clock uh, things start getting heated up in New Delhi railway station and that's probably because there are very few trains coming in or going out at deep midnight uh, past 12 o'clock and as things get uh, heated up around 6 p.m. Uh, things get progressively worse and then uh, CT which is now a big metro hub right so there is a lot of cross traffic uh, going into CT and coming out of CT it's a major metro hub now Rajiv Chowk as we call it so um, this urban activity picks up at around 9 and 10 and then you can see during the day it gets progressively worse uh, which and it stays pretty bad all through the day and then uh, I think this, this red patch further down is about 2400 milliseconds of latency. That's about 2.5 seconds. That's a lot of time in internet speed to go from uh, your smartphone in that area to Mumbai and come back. Right? That's really bad performance. Uh, and our hypothesis is there are a lot of central government offices there. So between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. there are people streaming out of their offices and trying to, and trying to get out back home. Uh, <laughs> That's all central government offices on that road. Uh, all big buildings with massive, um, you know, population, working populations. Uh, so these are uh, sort of instructive uh, aids, not just for figuring out how to make networks work better in real life, but are uh, good proxies to how uh, people move around within the town. And if you add additional uh, parameters like where are people stopping and going uh, to your traces. Uh, you can actually make even more instructive visualizations out of it. So that's kind of the the, the eye candy part of it. Um, and then the way we do it, like I mentioned, is that we, we, we prioritize applications performance. So we don't necessarily care about the inards of the network or does geo operate it or does geo connect it to um, say rain tells wire in the ground, fiber in the ground. And does it go over rail, rail tells network from Delhi to Mumbai or does it go through some other peering system? Because uh, you might be aware that uh, internet peering is, is always has a lot of uh, cooperating parties who shuffle traffic from point A to point B. So we don't go that, lip, that deep into the stack, but we want to prioritize uh, end users' performance uh, and how app developers specifically can use APIs in this data to make their apps faster. Uh, that's Foster's perspective on it. So, uh, so yeah, so, so developer first perspective is what our attempt as a startup is to build on top of it. And uh, currently about 200,000 smartphones are contributing this telemetry to us. And these are spread over Southeast Asia and India at the moment. And Southeast Asia specifically, I mean, excuse me, Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, and we're trying to get to Thailand. Uh, because Thailand also has a booming uh, mobile-first economy. Uh, Software-wise, we use Go a lot. Uh, we are sort of, um, I have a bias towards C and Unix, so I got into Go. Go traditionally doesn't have had a strong uh, geo-aware uh, tooling and libraries, but that is fast-changing. Elasticsearch is sort of a nice database which knows how to handle um, geo tag data relatively well. Uh, but we are thinking of uh, moving to post Postgres. Uh, with GI support. Uh, Mapbox has been really wonderful. I have some web development background, so it has really been a boon uh, to get started. Like I said, we have an app that uses Google Maps SDK on Android, and that's what our driver partners use in order to contribute data to us, and also be aware of how their internet happens to be in real time. Um, so that's it. So I showed you the time varying demo. Uh, if you need sort of a quick primer on why this occurs, I can get into that. As an acknowledgement, I can uh, I want to like to thank Raghu, of course, who has been 
helping with uh, both the concepting as well as the rollout, working with driver partners, interviewing them as part of consumer standing. Uh, he camped out for one week at the Bangalore airport and had installed the app with a few hundred drivers. Uh, so, uh, and at, on old airport road. So, uh, getting real users feedback is a key part of product development, and um, Raghu has been extremely instrumental in helping that uh, work. And owning your own consumer app is, is powerful if you're building a platform because it allows you to really have control over how you're collecting data, what you're collecting, and ship a new improvement every week. So you control the endpoints and it's really powerful for moving fast. So Namita is our designer. She's in Delhi, so she can join us. But she has been instrumental with our use, user experience as well as uh, giving us more comfort with data visualization on a map. Um, pardon the typo there. Rasakya, like I said, has been really helpful with getting us started on Mapbox. So thank you for that. Pradeep uh, from Grab slash Ola isn't here, but he's been really helpful buying us a lot of coffees. Uh, he jokes from SoftBank investments that went into Ola. And perhaps Grab, is it Grab funded by SoftBank too? So he jokes always that, don't thank me, thank uh, Mr. Son from SoftBank for all the VC money. Uh, so jokes apart, that's all we have. Um, and if there are any questions, I would love to um, answer. Probably not a, won't have a commercial angle to it, but uh, okay. how do we map the 4G latencies in cases where we won't have ride sharing apps, but uh, out <laughs> somewhere in the middle, throwing it out there? Yeah. Um, so when you build a practical system, you have to start. Yeah. So I'm a builder. I'm not an idealist. Okay, I am an idealist, but my builder part is bigger than the idealist part. <laughs> So you have to start somewhere, and as you might imagine, um, that's a good question because it speaks to some of the discussions we have with Rebu as part of the core product and architecture. In cities like Bangalore, um, people don't move outside Bangalore apart from the weekend. So if there's a tri driver, he or she is coming, from, they're all he's here, but they're coming from Hassan, for example. So they come all the week and they go back on a two hour commute. So the Hassan Bangor Highway gets mapped really well. Now our app, the consumer app, the, the one that drivers use, does not talk about the areas outside the city. So we have a bounding box and it focuses only on the data there and it works offline there. Uh, but from a data collection perspective, we do get data from all over the place where humans move. Or at least the demographic that we need to see the map moves. Now that doesn't work very well in Indonesia and we are trying to change our architecture and design for that. Because uh, it's a very island -y country, right? So Indonesia is nothing but a bunch of islands and coastlines and people living near coastlines. And like, you've, if you've been to Kerala, you understand that people live all around the coastlines. It's like a long highway and like everything melds into one another and it's basically continuous habitations all along the thing, right? So uh, the fixed model of an urban agglomeration breaks down when there are coastal communities. And that happens in Indonesia a lot. So um, the practicalities are a part of bootstrapping a mapping system, which is crowdsourced. Uh, how the product uses that representation or not is important. And, and we started with the naive assumption that you make a box around the city and you say there are only 10 cities supported. There are 18 right now. But again, the point is we count cities right now. Perhaps we should not be. Uh, so the answer is, you know, are we trying to build a practical system and then we take some product decisions to hopefully make informed choices on that? There's one more question. So, um, again, um, it's sort of reduction. We care for driver partners because they're financially motivated to ensure the livelihood for the day, right? Now, a secondary uh, consequence of that uh, is that they move around where the, supply, where the demand is, right? Uh, so they're plugged in, their phones are plugged in all the time. 
and they move around where people need to be picked up. So whether the person being picked up is a government employee or not, is not pertinent to the fact that most of your sensors, let's think of those phones as sensors, most of your sensors are in a Tata Indica, which has been driven around for hire, right? So uh, that does not conflict with the fact by itself that those people are either government employees or normal non-government employees. Now that hypothesis specifically was about that red blot at 5 p.m. Because that only happens there at 5 p.m. And when we looked at Google Maps, we saw that all of those was those Southerns and Kendria things, which basically Central Delhi does a lot of. And those are all massive central government departments. Everybody clocks off and punches in at the same time. So that was purely that observation. But the fact that your measurement framework does not bias for or against that demographic of movement is also important. Like your, your method of measurement should not be biased in ways that you haven't thought of. Or at least you should have 80% of the biases thought through of that measurement vector. So a uh, quick primer on this, one second. So, this is the theory of why networks fail over. Uh, this is fun because you may, most of you may not have thought through this. Um, so the second column on, uh, on the left is ENB, that's your base station. So when you uh, make a data call on your phone, which means you're trying to browse a web page, you first talk to this base station, which is the ENB. And that requires a very careful choreography of requests for a time slot and the response from the base station that yes, your phone should now transmit. So you just don't like throw data over the air, right? Like that doesn't work, that's not the protocol. Protocol is you ask for permission, which is that arrow SR going through, which is a request. And on the back channel is a grant. So the base station says, at this megahertz, for this many microseconds, please send data now. And then the phone sends whatever is buffered, which is for example, get, NDTV.com is an HTTP request. So then the phone gets to flush the operating system's networking queue and sends the data on the wire. And then another grant comes when the data is coming back from NDTV server. And NDTV server would be the app server on the extreme right. That's your web server, for example. Uh, and PGW next to the, this is the router that Geo or Airtel maintains, which plugs into the backbone of the internet. So even on the back channel, when, we, when you need an acknowledgement that your GET request for NDTV.com got to that server, the base station needs to give a grant, like those bottom grant arrow shows going leftwards, to your phone saying that now I'm going to send you data which came from upstream. So everything that you do on your phone requires this careful choreography of allocating very scarce spectrum, which is airwaves, which are licensed by the government of India, only once in five years, right? We've all heard of the 2G scams and the 3G scams. Right? So all of those are uh, spectrum auctioning processes, which are extremely remunerative for the central government. And those apportion very scarce public resources for use by the services that you take for granted every day. So any, any, whenever there are 1,000 people requesting a grant, at the same time, you can imagine that there isn't enough spectrum to give you a, a grant of, of, a, of a time slot, basically of a frequency as well as a time slot which goes together. And then your data does not leave the phone, and then your browser says that we are having trouble loading this page. So that's sort of the mechanics that we are mapping. That's it. All right, thanks so much, Siddharth. Thank you everyone for like, being patient. And this was the last session for the day. I would request you all to go grab some coffee, tea, have some conversations and then I'll see you all at the auditorium at 4.30 for the keynote. Thank you.